a professional violinist was giving a concert. He was so good that when he finished, he received a standing ovation from his audience. But the young violinist, with tears coming down his cheeks, walked off the stage sad. Now a stage crew saw him and could not help but ask, Why are you so sad? Those people are going crazy out there and you are crying. I don't understand. And then he said, do you see the man in the center down there? He is still sitting. The crew said, yeah, so what? But there are 2,000 other people who are standing. Why look focus on that one man? This is true, but you don't understand. The man down there in the middle is my dad, and he's also my violent teacher. If he doesn't stand, it doesn't matter what 2,000 other people do. Now, the violinist's attitude towards his father's approval is a good example of what our attitude must be towards what we do in life as a whole and the service we give to God. It doesn't matter if all the people who know us give us a standing ovation or click like on our FB account. If God doesn't approve. But then the question is, how will we know that God approves what we do for Him and for other people? How do we know? If God has given us a thumbs up. Now let's answer that very important question by going to 1 Timothy First Timothy chapter 1, verse 12 to 17. Palihog, ablihi ang inyong mga Biblia. Diha sa unang Timotio, kapitulo 1, versikulo 12, hangtod na sa 17. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 12 to 17. No? Ato ang tubagon, ang pangutana. So, unsaon man na ito pagkaibaw, nga kining atong pagsilbi, pagpangalagad, aprobado, at tubangan sa ginoo. Now, dagang paagi, no? We, we can answer that through many parts of the scripture, but here, let me bring your attention to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. I thank Christ Jesus. This is the Paul, the Apostle Paul speaking, writing to his disciple, Timothy, who at this point is in Ephesus. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor. Yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all. Yet, for this reason, I found mercy so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. And he does not stop there. He tells us in verse 17, Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. 
How will we know that God approves what we do for Him and for other people? Sana ito pagkahibaw, ang aprobado ang atong gibuhat, tubangan sa gino o alang sa ubang mga tao. Now from this passage, doon ay tulog kabutang, there are three things that I want us to look at. Number one is that we have here a priority we must not miss. There's a priority that we must not miss here. Usa ka prioridad, no? Nga dili yun. Nga bantayan nato, nga dili nato, ma mataligaman sa laum-laum pa nga pagkasibuano. Na unsa maning priority? What is this priority? What is the important thing that we must not miss? It is this. Salvation must come first and service only second. Salvation must come first, service only second. First things first. Kinahanglan, una ang kaluwasan, una pa ang pagsilbi. Una pa ang pag-alagad sa ginoo. In other words, you must first be saved before your service will matter before God. Being saved is a prerequisite to a service that is acceptable to God. And this is very important because if we are wrong here, we are wrong in everything that we do. Notice that in verse 12, Paul talks about being put to, into service by Christ. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. I thank Christ Jesus who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, and notice, he says, putting me into service. Christ put him into service. That's verse 12. Now, I want you to look at verse 15. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all. Now, in these four verses, Paul connects service and salvation. He speaks of what he does as a servant of Christ, yes, but his service is in connection to what Christ has done for sinners. For Paul, before he is a servant of Christ, he is first a sinner saved by Christ. He is saved to serve. This, there is a clear priority a priority we cannot afford to miss. Before we are a servant of Christ, we are a sinner turned into a saint by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now what does this mean? Now, before we talk of our service, let us first talk about our Savior. Before we have that delight in what we have done for Christ with Christ, we must first talk about Him, our Savior. The Christian life is first about what God has done in Christ, not what we do for God. It is first about who we are in Christ before it is about what we do. And this is important to emphasize because we often think, oftentimes think of service as something we do for God. Of course, this is correct. But we must also remember that service is a response. It is a response to what God has done to us first. 
Service that matters to God is one that is done based on what He has done to us in connection to Christ. Now, what did God do? First, He sent His Son into the world to save sinners. Verse 15, it is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's first. And those who believe in him will not perish, will have, but have eternal life. And when these sinners are turned into saints, there's a group of people willing to serve, be spent, to spend and be spent with this God who is Savior. God brought sinners to Christ through the work of the Holy Spirit. So let me repeat first things first. There must be a priority. And here in the Word of God, we are given a clear priority. Let us beware of the danger of legalism and its many forms. The most common is what is at the heart of all man-made religion. It teaches us that we can buy salvation with our money of good works. Lainain lang dagway, pero maorgid gihapon, good works. Sa uban ang ilang version, lighting a candle, going to church, magluhod. Ang uban, ang ilang huna-huna, kaya wak man silang magdakuan ng context, is going to the church, reading the Bible. But the idea is, if I do this, God will be pleased. And as a result, or as a reward, I will be saved. Legalists will tell you that salvation is the result of good works. Service first, then salvation will come as a reward. But this is not what God, who cannot lie, tells us in His Word. Ephesians chapter 2. A very familiar passage for many of us, I believe, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 10. Again, the Apostle Paul, guided by the Spirit of God, for by grace you have been saved. By grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, so that we would walk in them. So from here we find God wants good works. Yes. But He must first give His grace to sinners, turn them into saved souls before that good works, which He approves, can even happen. Reverse the order and it is something that God hates. Remember? In Isaiah, in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 64, chapter 64, verse 6, For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds 
righteous deeds are like a filthy garment and all of us wither like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind take us away. Measured against the standard of God which is perfection, what we call as righteousness is filthy, dirty clothes before God. It will never pass God's quality standard. And that's why God must move. He can't wait for sinners to satisfy His perfect standard. And so here, going back to Ephesians chapter 2, we are told, you know what? Salvation is not because you work for it. God worked in His grace, giving us Christ, His Son. And that's why there is salvation, there is hope for sinners. Now in John chapter 15, verse 5, we are also told, I am divine, the Lord Jesus says, telling His disciples, You are the branches, He who abides in Me, and I in Him, He bears much fruit. Why? Jesus says, For apart from me, you can do nothing. You minus Christ equals zero. Apart from Christ, we are nothing. We can do nothing. So many wisdom sa ginoo. Before you can serve Him, he will, he will first, you need first to be turned into a saint, a child of God, somebody who is no longer angry with God. Because imagine you are a king. Will you allow just anyone to serve you? Will you want even your enemies to serve as your bodyguard and chef? Ang ikaw hari, ang imuhang bodyguard, imong kontra? Ang imong tigluto, imong kontra? Will you allow somebody who is an enemy to be that close? Now, bisan gani kita mo ingot, no, no way. Also with God. So if you want to serve the king, you must not you must first ask, I am I in the Lord. The desire is good. I want to serve God. I want to be of use for his kingdom. And that is a good desire. But things first things first. You must first ask the question. Am I in the Lord? Am I joined to Christ? Has there been a time in my life, there was a time when I was embracing sin, but there was a point when I let go of sin, turned my back and embraced my Savior. Because if you are still desiring, if you are desiring to serve God, but then still committed to sin, God will not allow you to do that. You have to let go and make a commitment. My will is for Christ. I will turn from sin and I will turn to Christ. And then your service will matter to God. Again, first things first. So a priority that we must not miss. Ikaduha, a perspective we must have. Usa ka panglantaw, pagtanaw sa usa ka sitwasyon na kinahanglan ni Anato. Now what is this perspective? Unsa man nga panglantaw? What is this way of looking at things? 
it is this. Christian service is not first about us and what we do. Christian service is not first about us and what we do. Kining pagpangalagad sa ginuuna sa tanan, it's not about me. Dili ni siya, may tungod na ko, ug unsay akong gibuhat. In our passage, Paul talks about being put into service. Going back to first. Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because He considered me faithful putting me into service. Yes, the Apostle Paul was serving Christ, but for him, no, first of all, it is about Christ who counted me worthy to become His servant. It's about Him. Yes, there are things that I do, but it is only second. First things first again. Many versions say appointing. Now Paul here is not self-appointed. He is not in the service because of himself. This is important for us to remember because we often forget that Christian service is not first about us and what we do. Paul tells us, I am in the service because Christ put me there. Christ considered me faithful, putting me into service. Service is much bigger than us. It is about Christ giving us a work to do. Now, the thought of being put into service made Paul thankful. Just to think about it. He tells us, I thank Christ Jesus. Paul is thankful, although serving for him often meant suffering. If you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, In in the case of the Apostle Paul, for him, the service, the root that God has given him is not easy. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to 29. Let's begin verse 21. To my shame, I must say that we have been weak by comparison, but in whatever respect anyone else is bold, I speak in foolishness. Here, the Apostle Paul defends his apostleship. I am just as bold myself. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane. I more so, in far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure of me, of concern for all the churches. Who is weak without my being weak? Who is led into sin without my intense concern? So compared with the Apostle Paul, waran inyo nila, waran kita skumingking. Waran kita tingalis buling sa kuko. Sa kuminking ni Apostle Paul. 
But the question is, but what explains Paul's thanksgiving? Why didn't he give up? Why was he thankful? Why? Because he experienced the power of pure grace. He experienced the power of, Paul, of, of pure grace. Now, Paul remembers who he was before he was put into service. Before he was saved, he could never forget that he was a blasphemer, persecutor, and violent aggressor. He tells us here in verse 13, Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. Yes, the Apostle Paul experienced unimaginable hardship in his following Christ, in his service to our King. But for him, compared with who he was before, these hardships are nothing. It should not surprise us why he calls himself the foremost of sinners. He repeats it in verse 15. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all. Yet for this reason I found mercy so that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Here the Apostle Paul sees himself at the bottom of the pile of hell-deserving sinners. He was there at the bottom. Oh, but Christ took him out. Not only that, Christ placed him in a high position. He became an official representative, an apostle, a sent out one. He did not deserve to be saved, much more be put into such a position. But Christ did it for Apostle Paul. He deserved to be condemned. Instead, he was forgiven and put into service. He was a public enemy. Public enemy number one. But he was shown mercy and love. Verse 13, Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy. I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord Jesus, of our Lord, was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. He, mo he was among the worst of Christ's enemies. But Christ chose to give him amnesty and given the position of an ambassador Paul was a great sinner but Christ showed him that he was a greater savior this is pure grace in action not because the apostle Paul when he was still Saul a persecutor deserved to be called even a saint. But Christ came, picked him out, gave himself for the Apostle Paul. Now, if you've really experienced God's grace like Paul, you will never be the same again. You will never be the same again. You will be thankful like Paul. Thankfulness is our natural response to God's grace. In 1 Corinthians 
chapter 15, verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And His grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them. Yet not I, not I, but the grace of God with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believe. It's the grace of God. It's the grace of God. If you have known the grace of God like the Apostle Paul, you will be like the former demon-possessed man whom Christ freed. He wanted to follow him. He was there in chains for a long time. People would not go to him. People were afraid of him. He was there in the tombs all by himself because nobody can go near him. And then Christ came into his personal life. And his personal experience freed him from those demons and he was free. And what was the natural response? Lord, I want to follow you. I want to serve you. But Christ said no. No. Go to your family. Tell them what God has done. Thankfulness leads to love and service. It's a natural result. It doesn't have to be forced. Now what's the practical relevance? Now this perspective will prevent us from any self-boasting. It will keep us away from exalting ourselves. This is true when God rewards our service with success. This will free us from any superstar mentality in the church. You know what I did? Look at the result. And there's something in us that, oh, wow, you must be someone. But when we remember who we are, before God in His mercy. Dealt with us. We will say, no Lord. I am just a poor slave. I am nothing. Whatever be the result, that's God's working. To God, through the glory. And also this perspective will keep us from being discouraged. To be thankful, we are accepted because of who we are in Christ and not because of what we do will give us strength to continue even when there is no success in our endeavors. On side A, you work, you serve Christ. Wow! Amazing result. Side B, you work, you give your heart out. No result. And especially in our day, people gauge our faithfulness using numbers. But then, this perspective will keep us from discouragement. And also, this perspective will stop us from craving for the appreciation of men. God has give, done us the greatest favor. Of course, this does not mean that appreciation is not welcome, but we do not crave for it. God has accepted me in Christ. All the appreciation that people can give are but extra. Extra rana. Bisan pagwa ang appreciation sa mga tao. Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing. No one on earth. And until we come to that point, 
miserable gyud ang atong kinabuhi. There will be times when you work so hard, but people just cannot see it. Sige kag post sa imong FB, wa may mo like. What's wrong with me? But if you know you are accepted in Christ, you cannot say, who cares? You still care, but you will not crave. And I think there's a difference between desiring and craving for people's approval. This will make us continue when we are not appreciated or even perhaps when we are opposed. Now, in our passage, we do not only have a priority. We must not miss a perspective we must have, but also, lastly, thirdly, a purpose we must focus on. A purpose we must focus on. Being saved is not the end, but only the beginning of something greater. Serving God. Our passage tells of even something more, something higher. And what is this? God's glory. We are told in verse 17, Now to the King Eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Also, he tells us in Romans chapter 11, verse 36, For from Him, referring to God, For from Him, and through Him, and to Him, are all things to Him be the glory forever. Amen. God is the source. He is the sustainer. He is the goal of everything. God does what He does. To get glory for himself. And this is the reason behind creation. He made the world and everything in it for his glory. He sustains the world, although it has fallen into sin, for his glory. In his work of salvation, he takes out sinners makes them clean by the blood of Jesus. For what reason? Turn them into citizens of His kingdom, children in His family. For what reason? Glory Himself. God does what He does to get glory for Himself. Salvation is for the glory of God. Service is for the glory of God. Both salvation and service serve a higher purpose. God's glory. God's grace in salvation and service is for His glory. And that's why if God does not get the glory He deserves in our service, then something is terribly wrong. We might be impressed. Other people might be impressed. But if God is not impressed because He does not get the glory in the service that we give, that service is useless. If God doesn't prove when He sees how we serve Him because the glory doesn't go to Him, it does not matter what everybody thinks about our service. It's useless. Now the question is, is this the attitude of our heart? Is God's glory the reason why we use whatever gifts we have in our service. Is your chief end in life to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever? Is your eating 
drinking and all that you do for the glory of God? Do you use the good that God has given you to do good to others for the glory of God? Now, we may, we may have memorized this, but my question is, is this true inside? Not just here. Not just intellectually. Not just mentally. Not just in our minds. But do we feel its power? Is this true of our personal experience? Is the glory of God still so strong in your soul that everything you do, you can say with a clear conscience, Lord, you know, it's for your glory. Yes, Lord, not perfectly. That's why I need Christ still. But Lord, you know everything I do. It's for you, for your honor, that people will understand that you are a great God. That you are not only creator and sustainer, but you are savior. Worthy of our praise. Worthy of our thanksgiving. In spite of our circumstances. Lord, everything is yours. Everything is for you. Brethren, let us not miss this priority. Before... You can serve Christ. If you are here who is not yet a child of God, never miss this priority. Before you can serve Christ, He must first save you. Now probably you have that desire in your heart. I want to be of use in the kingdom of God. That's a good desire. But as we have seen, first things first. Before you can serve the king, are you saved by the king? Are you? If you are, let us maintain the right perspective. Christian service is not first about what we do. It is about what God in Christ has done for us and through us. Our response to God's work is a life of devoted service. Let our focus be on the glory of God in everything that we do.